Well, let's continue our worship as we open God's Word to the book of Ephesians. It's great to sing with you. It is a joy. It is our worship to sing. We worship the Lord. We worship the Lord when we pray together. We worship the Lord when we read Scripture and the Scripture reading. And we also worship the Lord when the Word is preached. So we're in the book of Ephesians, an expository series. If you haven't uh, been with us or been with us in a while, we're in Ephesians chapter 2. And I'll be preaching on Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. I really love the book of Ephesians. It's a short book compared to many others, but it contains so much doctrine, so much application. It's a mini Romans, but it also covers things that aren't in Romans, and it covers things that aren't in any other book. And one main focus that Paul wants to get across in Ephesians is the church. He wants to teach about the doctrine of the church. And in this section, he switches from talking individually and how Jew and Gentile has been united to looking at the church as God's new creation. I want to read to you Ephesians 2. I'm going to start back in verse 11 so you can get the context for where we're going today. It's all connected. It's all in one paragraph. We want to get the context. That's part of proper interpretation. So beginning in Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, the enmity which is the law of commandments and contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Lord, we ask for your help this morning as we learn about the church. Help us to love your church. Help us to understand why you've put it on this earth. Help us to know why you are building it, why you have built it in the past and continue to build it. And our place in that church, Lord, help us to love your church and want to serve and glorify you in it. Amen. Well, what is the church? What is the New Testament Christ-redeemed group of believers called the church? Many people are struggling with that answer. If you look out in Christianity today, we often are asking, what is the church supposed to be about? What is the church supposed to do? What does the Bible say about the church? That's a question often ignored. The Bible does give us answers to those questions. The church is not what we want it to be. The church is not whatever we can dream up in our minds. The church is not what a bunch of scholars can get together and figure out in their own human reason. The church is exactly what God's word says it is. And Paul has a lot to teach us about the church in Ephesians. Paul has a lot to say about what the church is and what it should be doing. Who are we individually as Christians? That's important. What should we we be doing individually as Christians? That's important. But remember, Ephesians is written to a body of believers, a church. And so it's not just about you and you and you individually, but it's about us together. Who are we together? And what are we supposed to do together? Well, here he begins this discussion, which will carry us into chapter three about who we are as a church. And then in chapter four, he'll start talking about what we are to do as a church. And 
Paul goes into this idea in chapter 2 here, 19 through 22, of God's new creation. Not the new heavens and the new earth. That's not the new creation I'm referring to. But it is something new. It's something that wasn't found in the Old Testament. It wasn't found in the Old Covenant. This is something new. It's, it's a new thing. It's one new man. It's a new covenant in Christ. In doing that in these verses, he's going to use four illustrations, four illustrations. And most of them are building illustrations. You know, we talk when I mean, we kind of joke the church is not a building and it's not. Even though we often think of the church and, you know, churches in a town as a building. But here it's interesting. Paul uses a building analogy to describe what a church is. We're going to see many of those words being used. But the church is not a building. It's an analogy the church is a body of believers gathering together locally to worship the Lord, to, to do the two ordinances, to preach the word, to pray together, and to do church discipline. But here he's talking about the universal church too. He's talking about all churches combined together into one church of God. Well, let's look at those four illustrations. First of all, I want you to see the people of God in verse 19. Now, I wanted to call this one the kingdom of God, like many people do, but he's not talking about the kingdom here. I wanted to say, well, it's the country of God, because that's a little bit closer to what he's getting at. But that doesn't sound very ancient, the country of God. That almost sounds like we're in God's country. Um, and, and we kind of joke about that. This is God's country in the South and in Texas. But I think the best illustration is we're the people of God. What is the church? It's the people of God. And if you know your Old Testament, that's a pretty big deal. That's not a small thing. The nation Israel was the people of God in the Old Testament. Two thirds of your Bible, you're looking for the people of God. You're looking for a Jewish person who lives in the land and is worshiping Yahweh, the God of Israel. And, and you could come in and worship if you were a Gentile, but you really weren't considered the people of God. You were living amongst the people of God and you might be blessed. Many Gentiles were. But now a Gentile under the new covenant can become part of the people of God. That's what he's getting at in verse 19. So then, that's a major conclusion that he's basing on what he just taught in the previous paragraph. So then, because Jew and Gentile are united in Christ as believers in Christ. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. As Gentile unbelievers, when we were unbelievers, we were strangers. We were aliens to God. He knew who we were, but we had no part of him. We had no part of his people, no part of his promises. That's what we just read about back in uh, 2.12. But now in, in Christ, if you're in Christ here today, if, if he's your Lord, if you follow him, if he's your savior, you're no longer a stranger or an alien to God. You are one of his. The church is. Are, is made up of the people of God, those that he has saved and brought them close and brought them near. That's what we read about in 2.18. We have access to God. We're no longer far off, but we're near him. Why? Because of Christ and what Christ has done. So Paul says we're no longer strangers. The word strangers, xenos in the Greek here, a person who happens to be in a foreign land. A stranger is somebody who's just touring through a foreign land. He doesn't really live there, but he happens to be there at that time. And then he uses another word here, aliens. Aliens, a resident alien. Uh, living in another country, a person living in that country, a resident alien, but without any legal rights. These two, strangers and aliens, they have no privileges to the country that they're in. If you go to another country today and you're just on a, on a tour, you have no rights really there. You have no rights unless they've written somewhere in today's constitutions that you have some rights as a tourist. But you're not one of the citizens. If you move there and you get a resident status to work there, you're still not one of the citizens unless you go through the citizenship process. Well, Paul says you weren't these things and now you are a citizen. You are. Because remember in 2.12, he said unbelieving Gentiles were excluded. They were alienated. And you probably heard me read citizenship instead of commonwealth. They were alienated from the citizenship of Israel. We were not a citizen in Israel. And we're really not even that today. We're a citizen of something new. 
We're a citizen of heaven. We're a citizen in God's church. Jew and Gentile brought together. Look at the rest of this verse. But you are fellow citizens with the saints. We were nobodies. We really were nobodies until Christ saved us. Not that God doesn't care about his creation, but we had no place to call home. We had no God. We had no Messiah. We had no country that we belonged to in the spiritual realm. We had no nation that we belonged to. But now we're people of God. Now we're people of God. Not that we've replaced the Jews, but we've joined with believing Jews, believing Gentiles and believing Jews together to form something completely new. The church. The church. All believing Jews and Gentiles are one in Christ. We're all fellow citizens together. There's no second class citizens. It's not like the Jewish believer is above the Gentile believer. Jews don't get a higher class status in the church because they grew up around the Bible or they, they grew up learning the commandments. We're all fellow citizens. We're all fellow citizens in the church. And it says, it says with the saints. It's amazing enough that Jew and Gentile could come together, that Christ could break down that barrier between them. But now he says, we're fellow citizens in God's country with God's people and with the holy ones. All the holy ones that God has ever saved. You know, saints aren't in the Bible. They're not these little statues that people put in their yard or the little things they put around their neck. That's not a saint. A saint is a believer in Christ. A saint is, is a believer that followed God faithfully in the Old Testament. Holy ones, righteous ones. Not by their own works, but because God made them holy. He made them righteous. He saved them. So we're fellow citizens with the saints. We used to have no people, and now we have all the people that God has ever saved as part of our people. All the redeemed that are joined to make up new people. Before Abraham, God saved people. You know that? God saved people before he made a covenant with Abraham. God saved people like Enoch, Noah, Job, Melchizedek. And we could go on and on. Then you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of Israel. We're fellow citizens with them. They're holy ones. They're saints. Yes, they're in heaven now, but we are one universal church with them. After Abraham until Christ, you had believing saints in Israel, holy ones that God had saved, those who were looking forward to the Messiah. How were you saved in the Old Testament? Not by works, but you were looking forward to the Messiah. You trusted in God. You tried to live a righteous life, not to earn your salvation, but because you loved the Lord and you were looking forward to the fulfillment of his promises. And since Christ has come for 2000 years, there have been believers. They've been saved by Christ. They've come and they've died and now they're with him in heaven. We're one with all of them. We're one with all of them. Not that we can speak to them, not that we can necessarily join with them today in person. They don't have the resurrected bodies yet. But we are one church and we are one people of God. The church started at Pentecost. So we're one with all those who've died since then. And we're one people of God going all the way back before Abraham. This is what Paul's getting at in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven. Roman citizenship was very important. Paul was a Roman citizen. It kept him from being beaten and killed. Roman citizenship was something that was very important at this time. And even as important as that was, Paul says, we are citizens of heaven from which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming back. We don't feel like we have a place now physically because we don't. We, we live in this world. We live in this country. We live in this state, in this city. But it's not our home. Heaven is our home and not just a spiritual place. But when Christ comes back and makes it physical, he remakes everything in the world. It's perfect. It's holy. A new creation. We will be there. We will be there because we are citizens of that place. We are citizens of heaven. We could say we are citizens of the coming kingdom. Again, this, this does not mean that believing Gentiles have replaced ethnic Israel. God made promises to Israel in the Old Testament. He will fulfill them in his own time. See Romans 11 for that. But we are now joined together, believing Jews, believing Gentiles. Right now, we are one. We are the church. Let's give thanks to God for that. Where were you before you came to Christ? 
And now he saved you and he's made you one. You have a place. You have a place to look forward to. And you have a place now as the people of God. Secondly, now he begins to use these illustrations of a house. He starts off with a household. Number two, the household of God. Number two, the household of God. So he's going to move from people to household, meaning family. And then he's going to start talking about structures that are being built. But secondly, what I want you to see here, the figure that he uses is household of God. There are many of you who have told me that this family, this household right here is closer to you than many of your extended family members. This place, the the church, because you have so much in common with one another. We have Christ in common. What more could you ask for to have Christ in common? We have our worship in common. We have our, our fellowship in common. We pray for one another. Well, Paul is saying here that when we got saved, when God saved even a rotten pagan worshiping Gentile, he brought us into the household of God. He brought us into the household of God. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were dead. We were following the ways of tradition, maybe, in America. We were following the ways of legalism. We were following the ways of pagan world today. Do whatever you want, mysticism. And then God saved us. And he brought us into his household. We're we're one of his family members. That's what he says here at the end of verse 19. And are of the household of God. Not only do we have a, a place, a people but we also are part of God's own house. The household was made up of a large group of people in that day, made up of your children. Sometimes even the grandchildren lived in the same estate. You had slaves, you had uh, freemen that were hired to work on the estate. But we are God's children. If you're in the true church, if you're in Christ, you're one of his children. Paul says, we're now of God's household. Persons who are related by kinship is what this word means here related by kinship or circumstances, and they form a a closely knit group. And we have a common cause. We have something in common. We have a common belief. We're God's household. We're God's family. You're a part of God's family if you're in Christ. That's why the Bible encourages, really, it just assumes even that you'll be part of a local expression of God's family, that you'll be part of that. You can't be a part of a family by yourself. The Bible assumes that you'll join with a local expression of the church, that you will want to show yourself to be part of God's household as you join with others. So as God's household, the church, we have we have something in common. We have a belief in Christ. We have a common doctrine. If you go through our, for example, here, our members statement of faith, it's just a real short list of common doctrines that we all hold as members, that we all hold that the scripture is true and authoritative and inerrant. That Christ is fully God and fully man. That he was born of a virgin. And on down the list of the basics of the faith. We have that as a family in common. We share something in common. It's not blood. It's not genetics. But it's a spiritual blood. It's spiritual genetics. We are part of God's household. And he's going to take care of his household. And he's going to watch over his household. And he's going to protect his household. How do we get to be this way? Paul goes on here talking about the household. He says in verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So he's going to illustrate how this household came to be. And he says, having already been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The church isn't done being built yet, but it started. It started, Paul said, on this foundation called the apostles and the prophets. They have laid that foundation. They are the first to build Christ's church. That's why they're called the foundation. Now we need to stop and go into what are apostles and what are prophets. That's important to understand here. We we can't understand what he means until we define that. And there's so much confusion on those terms in today's world that we need to stop and look at them in a biblical sense. The apostles here, capital A really, are the 12 apostles. Of course, not Judas, but Matthias plus Paul. The 12 plus Paul who were chosen, commissioned, and sent by the Lord to proclaim the gospel and plant churches. How did the church get started? Jesus died on the cross and he preached for 40 days after he was resurrected, but then he ascended. How did the church spread all around the world? Well, it started with the apostles. It started with the 12 and then eventually Paul was saved as well and made an apostle by the Lord. 
The word apostle means appointed messenger. Someone given authority by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And there has to be three qualifications. Now, there's a lot of people that say they're apostles today. You probably have heard of apostle so-and-so. A lot of denominations have apostles. These are the three qualifications according to the Bible. First, you had to witness the resurrected Christ. You had to see him after he was resurrected. That's Acts 1.22. They, they're looking for somebody to replace Judas. And they say, hey, it's got to be somebody who has witnessed the resurrection, resurrected Christ. They've seen him. They've actually seen him. Secondly, they've got to be appointed by Christ himself. Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 9 and 15. It's got to be somebody that Christ appoints. You can't appoint yourself an apostle. Sorry. You just can't. You can't because an apostle is a messenger of Christ. And, and messengers don't get to appoint themselves messengers. They get appointed by the king to take the message. So they have to be appointed. And then thirdly, the Bible says they have to confirm that they are apostles. They have to confirm their mission and message by miraculous signs. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. They have to do miraculous signs. Not fake things. Not say they can do miracles, but not actually do them. No, the apostles were confirmed by miraculous signs. So those are the three qualifications of an apostle. The apostles went out, they proclaimed the gospel. They, they taught God's doctrine. They taught theology to the church. Paul spent three years with the Ephesians after the church was planted. He spent three years there teaching them. He wasn't just saying, repent of your sins, believe in Jesus. He was starting with that and continuing with that. But he taught all the doctrines with that as well. All the doctrines, how to live a holy life, how to please the Lord, Jesus' second coming, creation, all the doctrines that we would know of in the Bible. Paul touched on them very likely in that three-year period. So they went out and they, they planted churches and they taught those churches. They, they grew those churches up. Romans 15, 20, Paul says, And thus I aspire to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. Same word there, foundation. The idea is Paul wanted to go out and plant his own churches. Not for himself, but for God's sake and for the people, the Gentiles, that he was sent out to plant churches and preach the gospel in their midst. So he says, I don't want to go where somebody else has already started. My job, he says, is to go out and proclaim the gospel and start a new church in those places if God wills it. Now, the gifts of an apostle have passed away. That gift is no longer present for two reasons. I'll just give you right now two quick ones. No one can meet those three qualifications. Jesus isn't showing up in the flesh today so that people can see him. And. Just right here in this text, you can't lay a foundation twice. Once the foundation's laid, what do you do? You build on top of it. The foundation's been laid by the apostles and the prophets, and it continues now. The building continues to be built on top of that. You don't lay a foundation twice. It's already been laid. Now let's move to prophets. God sent prophets to the early church. What is a prophet? Well, if you put all the scriptures together, it's a, it's a believer, not an apostle. I don't think in this sense it's a different category. You got apostles. I think, I think they were prophets, of course. But then you have a second group called the prophets here. It's a believer who's endowed by the Holy Spirit with the gift of prophecy. What is the gift of prophecy? That's communicating direct revelation. The actual words of God to the church for a purpose. Edification. Comfort and encouragement. It's a believer who's been endowed with the Spirit, given the gift of prophecy, which is the communication of the words of God to the church for the purpose of edification, for encouragement, and for comfort. That's what a prophet is. That's what a prophet did in the, really even in the old, some of that is seen with Israel and their prophets. But in the new, we see that as well. There is a gift called the gift of prophecy. And prophets have the gift of prophecy. And they're speaking the words of God. These are not Old Testament prophets here. You notice the order in your Bible there? What's the order? First, you have apostles. Second, you have prophets. 
That's important. The order is important, especially in New Testament Greek language. The thing that was first comes first. The thing that was next comes after it. So if apostles, which are a New Testament office, come first, and then we see prophets. These are not prophets from the Old Testament that he's saying. The church has been founded on the apostles, messengers sent out by Christ, and the prophets, those who are speaking the words of God in each congregation in the New Testament church. Also go over to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, a lot of, um, the reason I'm making a point on this is because a lot of charismatics will say these are Old Testament prophets. They'll say that the prophets in the New Testament here in this passage are just the apostles. It's like apostles hyphen prophets. And then they'll say there's another group of people called prophets and they made mistakes and they made errors in their prophecy like prophets do today. No, these are not Old Testament prophets. These are not apostle prophets. These are apostles and New Testament prophets. Ephesians 3, 5. Which in other generations, talking about here the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. How's the gospel being made known? How's the proclamation of the mysteries of Christ going out from the churches? The apostles and the prophets, the New Testament prophets. Also go over to 411. 411, we'll come to these uh, verses in time, but I just want to show you now. There's a list here in 411, a list of offices, a list of giftings that Paul mentions. Christ gives these gifts to his church. 411, and he gave some as apostles. That's one group. And then just below apostles are the prophets. That's another group. And some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. And he goes on to talk about why he gave those offices. So you see there, apostles, New Testament office, prophets, New Testament office. These are New Testament prophets. They had the gift of prophecy. That was essential. You don't have a New Testament if you're in the early church. You've got your Old Testament, maybe. Maybe you've got your Old Testament or somebody in the church has an Old Testament. Probably in the Greek translation, the Septuagint. You might have a few of the letters being passed around at that time. James, the book of James. Maybe, maybe Galatians is a, being copied and transmitted. But how do you know how to live a godly life? We're not Israel, so we can't just go right down the Old Testament laws and live. We, we're not under the Old Covenant. Paul's already said that. How do you know how to live? Well, you've got a prophet there in the church, or maybe two, or maybe three. And so in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Paul talks about how to make sure you're doing the right thing as a prophet, not doing what you want all the time. But there are New Testament prophets, and they're declaring the word of God to people. What to believe, what kind of doctrines, how to live. These are important. And so prophets were essential, but there's no longer the gift of prophecy today. Why? Because you can't lay a foundation twice. The apostles and the prophets have been laid down as the foundation. What they taught and who they were made up the foundation. Now the church has been built for 2,000 years on top of that. You don't lay the foundation again. You don't continue to lay it down again. The Bible's complete. We, we have the prophecies we need now in here. We have everything we need. The scripture is sufficient. God doesn't need to continue sending prophets to the church because we have everything here. If this isn't enough, then we'll never have enough. We can't keep looking elsewhere. Not to mention many supposed prophets today are not even 100% accurate like the three tests of prophecy mentioned in the Bible. Well, some, someone might say, well, don't we need to lay a new foundation today? Don't we need to continue relaying a foundation because people have you know, forgotten it? Here's what, here's what one writer had to say, Thomas Edgar, who has a great little book on the spiritual gifts. He says, we still need the foundation, people say. Therefore, apostles and prophets are still given. He says, we still need Christ, the cornerstone today. But he's not been present physically since he ascended. Christ fulfilled his purpose on the earth, and the church continues based on that. Right? We don't, we don't go around saying, let me ignore the Bible while I look for Christ. Where is he at again? Let me talk to him. No, he's given us his word. Christ fulfilled his purpose on the earth. The church continues based on that. Likewise, the apostles and prophets fulfilled their purpose. And the church builds on that. 
There's a foundation that God is building on here. And this is God's word here. He said that these two offices were the foundation. It's been laid down. It's already been laid down for us. It was almost complete in Paul's day. By the end of the Bible, we're not seeing the gifts of prophecy and apostleship being mentioned. Well, the apostles and the prophets might be the foundation, but look at the rest of the verse. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. He is the most important stone of the foundation. That's the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of the building. Paul says, look, you got apostles and prophets and those are important. But let me draw attention to the most important part of the foundation. That's Jesus Christ himself. He's the most important part. It's an essential part of the building to have a cornerstone. And that day especially. Now today we have all these technologies and we build things differently. But back then... You had to look at each stone and ask yourself as a builder, where's that stone going to go? And what's the best place for that stone? And how can I shape this stone to be put here? And so you were looking, when you started a building, you were looking for the primary stone. The the first one, the cornerstone. Often the one that would be the downhill stone that would hold a lot of the weight. You were looking for the cornerstone, the chief stone. And when you put it down, when an architect put this down, a builder put this down, it determined the angle of the structure so that all other buildings would be fixed on that angle and all the cross walls and outside walls would be fixed on that. It's the first stone laid down. It holds the structure together and it serves as a standard for all other stones to be aligned to. This is Christ. He's the cornerstone. He's the first stone laid down. The rest of the foundation doesn't get put in until after he's laid down and everything lines up with the cornerstone. Everything lines up with him. What a great analogy that Paul's giving us here. He's really looking back and thinking, I think of Isaiah 28, Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm laying in Zion, a stone, a tested stone. One that's been tested, one that's been loaded up with some weight to be tested. A costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. Is he talking about a real stone? How do people believe in a real stone? No, this is a prophecy of the cornerstone, the Messiah, that's going to be placed in Zion, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And those who believe in him are not going to be disturbed. They're not going to be worried about future wrath. 1 Peter 2, 6 also quotes that. And Paul stresses Christ's role as a foundation stone. If you go back to 1 Corinthians 3, again, Paul's talking about individual churches here that he's planting or not planting. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. We'll just include 10 because it has a lot of the same language. 1 Corinthians 3, 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, Like God, who is the wise master builder, I laid the foundation and another is building on it. So Paul says, I I planted this church here in Corinth. Others have come and they've added to it as well. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the most important part of the foundation. Everything's got to line up with him. If it doesn't line up with Jesus, what's going to happen? It's going to fall off. It's going to fall off the building if it's not lined up properly as you build up. If if things get added, of course, God doesn't add any mistakes to his church. But if if we could try to add a piece into God's building here and it didn't line up with Christ, it would just fall off because it wouldn't be lined up properly. Christ is the stone by which every new person in Christ must be conformed to. He's the standard. He's the standard for all the stones, us, all the stones, They get added to the building. So we looked at two illustrations already, the people of God and the household of God. Number three, now the temple of God, the temple of God. What is the church? It's something new. It's a new people. It's a new household. And it's also a new temple. Now, the temple in the Old Testament was a special place. It was planned by David. It was built by Solomon. And then it was eventually destroyed by the Babylonians, rebuilt by King Herod. So in Paul's day, the temple's still standing. In Jesus' day, 
he would go up to the temple as well. The temple stood until 70 AD. And the temple was a place where you went to sacrifice and praise the Lord. It's where you went to join with others who were doing that as well. And it's where you went to go through those sacrifices so that, that your sin was passed on. Your sin was passed on into the animal, in a sense, that was being sacrificed until the Messiah came. The temple was a central place of worship. It's where God's presence was until he left the nation before the Babylonians came. It's where God's presence was. It's where the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and commit that one sacrifice, the blood from it, he would commit upon the Ark of the Covenant. He would, he would splash it on there. And that signified forgiveness for the whole nation. It was an important piece. It was holy. We were just talking before, before class about how the Jews would bow down and, and pray towards Jerusalem because the temple was there and God's special presence was in the temple. It was vital to their worship of God. And now Paul's going to say the church is like a temple. Look at verse 21. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. You can imagine how an unbelieving Jew would think this is blasphemy. The temple was holy. They were swearing by the temple in Jesus' day. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't swear by the temple. But they were. That's, that's how they had put so much into the building itself. Paul says, we're a holy temple. We're a holy temple as a church. In Christ, we are being built up, perfectly fitted together into a temple. Let's look at this word, fitted together. In the ancient world, they did not have or use mortar. Mortar is the glue that goes in between the bricks and the stones. So when you built a building, you didn't have it easy like today. It doesn't matter what the thing is shaped like. You can kind of fill in around it with the mortar. Back then, the stones had to sit perfectly on each other and perfectly side by side. So they had to carve them down to fit a certain way. And so there was great care when they were cutting these stones, when they were smoothing out these stones. They had to fit exactly one on top of the other and right next to each other. And if you didn't do it the right way, the building's going to fall down. Maybe on your own family. And certainly if it's a religious place like a temple, well, that would look really bad. In the pagan world, if you're, if you're a god, let his temple fall down or... In Jerusalem, if the God had his temple fall down. So great care was taken. And, and Paul's saying here, God's carefully taking each stone, each believer in Christ here, and he's shaping you and he's fitting you and he's putting you up there and fitting you together with the whole church. Not just Grace Bible Church, but the universal church. We each have a place. We each have a position. We each have something that we're to do. That's all combined in this idea that we are stones being placed into the church. God's carefully doing that. He didn't save you and just throw you into the building. You just go, you know, here, you, you will figure out where you need to go. He didn't say, you know what? I'm going to save you. I'm going to make you a stone. I'm going to put you in the building, but then you do what you want. You know, God has carefully and exactly cut you when he saved you. He cut the stone out just right. And he put it in its right place. Peter uses the same kind of talk. Peter does in 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, as living stones. So we're not just dead stones. We're living stones. The church is a growing structure. It's a growing organism. We're living stones. He says living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter, Paul, these are Jews who've been saved. And now they're saying, you know what? That temple in Jerusalem, it's going away, first of all. And secondly, that's not where we worship God. We worship God in the church. And, and the church is not a building. The church is a people. And the people are being built up by God into this great structure. And it's called God's holy temple. Now, this being fitted together is in the passive voice here. God has started the church. God has sent Christ the Son, God has laid the foundation with the apostles and prophets, and God is still building his temple. He's still working on it. It's in the passive voice here, which means that God's doing the work. We are not building God's temple. Who are we to build God's temple for him? We can't spiritually build God's universal church. We really can't 
do it locally either. God's doing it. We have to obey him and the church will be built. People will come in and hear the gospel. People will be matured and built up. But God's doing that. God, God built this church. We could not have done it. We could have done it in a manly, worldly way. We would probably have to build our own building by now, a $10 million facility. But we had to do it God's way if we want to honor him. We have to do it God's way. We don't get to choose. God is doing the work. We are to follow him and do the work that he's already told us and committed us to do. Well, notice also it's growing. You see how he says that? We're being fitted together, but it's growing. The temple's not finished being built yet. It's a church that continues to grow all around the world through the ages. When our church started here, it was just a few families from Kerrville Bible Church. And then it was people who showed up at my house for a Bible study on Tuesday nights. And we grew and grew there. And God was bringing people to us. And we had to look for a facility. So we found this place. And then we moved the, the Bible study here on Tuesday nights. And it was just about half this middle section here. And, and we would come and we would pray and study the Bible. And then we started worship services on Sunday. And it's grown and it's grown. And God has sometimes pruned off a little bit. And it's grown again. It's grown again. And not just in numbers. How many of us have grown in our own hearts spiritually? In our own minds? God continues to, to grow his church. This isn't a present tense. It's ongoing. It's continuous. It's a living, growing building. That's the way the universal church grows. Now let's look at this word, temple. Temple. It's, it's the temple building itself here, not the temple courts. Sometimes in the New Testament, Jesus was teaching in the temple. That, that's the temple courts, everything, the whole complex. This Greek word is just for the temple building itself. Where the priest went in, only the priest could go. Including the holy place and the holy of holies. It's a sacred place. Very few could ever even go there. And now we are the temple. The church is the temple. Yeah, God's making a new temple, his church. He's making a new temple. He's already dwelling there, but it's not completed. He's still building it. This is where the temple, the church is, is being built in the church in Christ. You see the end there? It's in Christ going into the holy temple in the Lord. You can't build the temple somewhere else. You can't build it with another religion, or another faith. You can't build it with your own works. God's doing the building. You're the stones that he's placing in there and he's building it in Christ. It's in Christ. It can't be built anywhere else. Unbelievers might come into a church service. Unbelievers might come into a church building and they're welcome to do that as they hear the gospel, see what we're like. But they're not part of this spiritual church to being talked about here, the true church, the universal church until they're saved. Until they're saved. That, that's when people become part of this holy temple. It's God's holy temple. And we can't be holy without Christ. So God has taken you, one of his stones, and he's specifically chosen you to be part of his building, his temple. And then fourthly, the last analogy goes along with this. The church is also God's dwelling. God's dwelling. It's a dwelling place of God. So not only are we being built up, but he says here, it's where God lives. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, God came into the temple when it was built. And then Ezekiel describes God leaving the temple before the Babylonians come and destroy it. God's special presence. God's everywhere, of course, at all times. But he manifested a special presence there in the temple with the people. He said he dwelt among them on Mount Zion in the temple above the Ark of the Covenant. And then it, his glory left. Before the city was destroyed. But now he's saying. The church is a permanent. Dwelling place of God. Look at verse 22. In whom. Talking about in Christ. In whom. You also are being built together. More building language here. Into a dwelling of God. In the spirit. In Christ in other words. We're being built into a place. That God permanently lives. He already lives in us, but not individually here. We're talking about the whole structure of the church and he's building and he's adding stones to it and he's growing it. And God is permanently already there and he's going to live in us forever and ever. 
We don't have to worry about him departing from us like he departed from Israel. We don't have to worry about him leaving his temple, the church. He's building his own house to live in. Again, we can't try to build God's house for him. We can only do what he tells us. We're his workmen. Who do we think we are that we can just throw away the commands of God in the Bible and go build his own house? I think God would like this kind of house better. I think God would like, you know, a few unbelievers mixed in. Maybe some pagans and mystics, unbelievers that don't care about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the house of God. Unbelievers are welcome to come and hear the gospel, but we ought not to change the church to suit the unbelieving world or just end up like every other pagan institution that ever existed. We are building God's house and he's building it through us as the church. God's building his own house. We aren't to try to build it. It's God's house. It's his temple. He is doing the building. And this word dwelling here, it's the last of six terms Paul's used now for architectural terms, building terms. This is the last one he uses in this section. He's used six of them. And this word here means a settled, deep dwelling place. It's not a temporary home. It's not a shelter. It's not a tent. This is a, a settled place. And it's, it's deep. It has deep roots is kind of the idea. It's well founded. It's going to endure. It's going to endure forever is the idea here. God's dwelling place. Well, I'll cite you a couple of passages in First and Second Corinthians that speak of how God does this. How does God dwell in us? He does it in His Spirit, in His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in each believer, and each believer making up the church, we have God in us. We have God in us, living in us. First Corinthians six nineteen, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And what are you? You're not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Second Corinthians 6.16 6, Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? In other words, you ought to live a holy life if you're the temple of God. And the church as a temple of God ought to be holy. What agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. God's living in the church. And he's continuing to build his own house. We cannot go off as a church and do our own thing. We cannot be unholy as a church. You as individuals can't be, Paul says. And the implication in Ephesians here is as a church, we can't either. We must not. We should not. This is why holiness is so important in the Corinthian letters because they have let themselves become stained and unholy. They've not cared about church discipline and they're, they're disgracing the temple of God, the church. And Paul's very, very forceful with them. And he says that they ought to get the leaven out of the bread, get the leaven out of the lump. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're the dwelling place of God. Let's not let unholiness Come into God's house. Well, do you notice here? Once again, we have all three persons of the Trinity. Paul ended with, in 2.18 with all of the Trinity. And again in verse 22. In Christ. Dwelling of God. That's God the Father. And we do that by the Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All involved in building God's house, the church. What a... Beautiful creation this is. We, we're, the, we're the people of God. We're the household of God. We're the temple of God. We're the dwelling of God. How important is the church to you? Is it this important to you? The whole church, the universal church, your local expression of that, the local church? Do you, do you value it like Paul says you should? It's the dwelling place of God. It's the temple of God. We ought to love the church. Not because everybody here is perfect. We ought to love the church because God is perfect and he is among us and he is in us. And this is our family. This is our family that God has given us to love and to serve and to care for. So in Christ, let's be unified and let's love one another as part of God's household. Lord, we do pray that we might be able to accomplish that very thing. We can only do it because you are doing it in us. Lord, we are not to 
come up with their own devices, our own schemes. This is simply a statement of fact. You, you are doing something new. It was not done in the old. It is now done under the new covenant. And we are to simply follow your will. This is who we are as a church. This is who all true churches are as a church. Thank you for revealing this to us. Help us to go and now live a holy life and be a holy church as an example. An example to point the world to. And let's tell them about Christ so they can come. So they can come, Lord, and be part of your family, your house, your temple. We pray these things in the name of our Savior.